Now the promise is unconditional. It was a one-way promise from God. Our unfaithfulness will not negate God's righteousness, but he's saying that Abraham understood that this promise was valid and he followed through with his part of, of the responsibility. Um, all right, go ahead. So Isaac stayed in your arms. Okay, that's one verse, and it's just to tell you that he obeyed the Lord. He's, in other words, verse 6 is fulfilling verse um, uh, whatever he said, do not go. Verse 2, and it is implying that he is doing what verse 5 just said. Abraham followed my, what I told him to do, my commandments, statutes, and my laws. Well, he just gave him one three, uh, three verses earlier in verse 2 when he said, stay in the land. So Isaac dwelt in the land. In other words, here's, a pro here's something I want you to do. Abraham did it, and then it's confirmed that Isaac did it too. Do you see that? It's just real quickly, you can see that uh, this may have happened over quite a bit of time, but it's just given to show the faithfulness that's being presented. One quick little verse, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Okay, seven. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister because he was afraid to say, she is my wife. Okay, real quickly in the middle of the verse. Like father, like son. Like father, like son. And more importantly, what is this as opposed to Abraham? Abraham, did he lie? No. No, he stretched the truth. Half-sister. Half is this guy lying? Yes. yes. Yeah, this is his like cousin maybe or second cousin from his... Abraham's whatever. So anyway, it's a relative, a close relative, but it's not a sister. So, you know, he learned from dad, and now he's following suit, but he's actually doing a little little more. Okay, go ahead, please. Listen to Jimmy Soul. Who? Jimmy Soul. Jimmy Soul. Never make a pretty woman your wife. Oh, yeah, that's right. That, that's right. Or you regret it for the rest of your life or whatever it is. That's right. If you want a, something, you want to be happy, happy to... Yeah. That's so from my personal point of view, pick an ugly girl to marry. That's right. That's how it goes. Ah, good song. Good song. Very true. All right, go ahead, Ken. I stopped in the middle of the verse there. He thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebecca because she is beautiful. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebecca. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, She is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Isaac answered him, Because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. Then Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of them men might well have slept with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. Okay, so in verse 6 we saw the faithfulness that he did what God told him to do. <laughs> And then in the next verse, we see the faithlessness when he, he thinks, I might die because of my wife, when God has already given him the promise. So within one verse, we go from faithful to faithless. All right? But once again, our faithlessness does not negate God's faithfulness. And so we go through the next few verses seeing that being set up, is that God protected the people from touching Rebekah despite Isaac's faithlessness. Okay, please. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, anyone who molests this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isaac planted crops in that land, and the same year reaped a hundredfold, because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich, and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. Okay, real quickly, 12 and 13... Are those descriptive or prescriptive passages? They describe what happened. That's all they do. But you can turn on TBN or CTN or any of these channels any day of the week and listen to Oral Roberts. And like I said, I've said this several times. I will turn them on like four times a day. I'll just turn to one of these people. And within, usually within eight to ten seconds, they are asking for money indirectly or promising that you will be blessed if you send them money. It, yeah. it never is it more than 60 seconds. And they use verses like this yeah. saying, God prospered them a hundredfold because, and then they put in their twisted theology and they say, because they were obedient. When we see right now that he wasn't obedient at all. He'd been lying, all right? He was yeah. obedient to stay, but they skip over all this stuff. They manipulate these scriptures yeah. and they do this continually. I got to tell you, you do whatever you want with your money, but the last thing Charlie Garrett will ever do is to send money to one of those people that promises that I will be blessed if I send them money. Yeah. All right? 
we got a church right here that needs money. And they do good things with it. They support missionaries all around the world. You know, I think everybody here except Ken attends this church. But, um, you know, oh, and my mom. But, she, yeah, she, yeah, that's true. My mom over here, she I'm attends. Like she, she, yeah, <laughs> see, my mom attends another Baptist church. and. Uh, <laughs> you are. She is your sister. She definitely is your sister. But you guys, um, uh, you do whatever you want, but I got to tell you, anybody that promises you that you will be blessed in this life for sending money or donating money or anything like that, I would stay as far away from them as you possibly can. Uh, you know what? We are destined for trouble in this life. We are destined for trials in this life by the mouth of the Lord himself and by the hand of the apostles. What is it says? I left Trophimus sick in Miletus, I think. Paul left a guy sick in Miletus. He wasn't healed, and this is the apostle Paul. Epaphroditus, a servant of the Lord, almost died. He, I'm sending him back to you. He almost died on account of the, uh, the gospel. These people really suffered, and yet they're promised that if you send Oral Roberts a seed offering of $111, he will bless you, and he will take away your sickness, and, your, and it's just nonsense. So very little on Christian TV that I watch and think, this is sound doctrine. There's very little of it. They've got something going on on channel on CTN, which is called The Great Awakening. Has anybody turned that on? It's been going on since January 2nd. And this is the most nonsense I've ever seen. They get people, different people have been coming on, and, and it's supposed to be revival. And here's what he said. Listen, listen to what he said. A couple days ago, I'm listening. He said, since January, we've had 22,166 conversions or, or uh, choices for Christ or every word. And he says, and we've had 7,000 baptisms of the Holy Spirit. And really? One, how do they know that they were baptized by the Holy Spirit? What are they doing? Calling and saying, I was baptized by the Holy Spirit because I, I, I got a pain in my stomach or something? I mean, and secondly, baptism of the Holy Spirit happens the moment you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You are baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and it's the moment you accept Christ. There's no such thing as a second baptism or coming to Christ and not being baptized. They are, happen at the same time. What happens with the Holy Spirit when you are obedient or when you're prayerful or when you're exalting God? What is it called? It's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's called being filling. Filling is repeatable. Baptism is one time. Yeah. The Bible is absolutely clear on that principle. Yeah. So if anybody ever says to you, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, give them a knuckle on the head and tell them to read their Bible, that that is not an appropriate term. But here they, they say these things on here and they're trying to get people to say, oh, yeah, look at all the great work they're doing for Jesus and send them in the money when yeah. their doctrine is so poor. It's so bad. I, I, you know, and I hate to beat these people up. They, they obviously love Jesus or at least the people in the congregation. I don't know about the people behind the pulpit, but, you know, I, I have no idea what their hearts are. Are they wanting money or are they really trying, thinking they're doing good? But crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Anyway, um, yes? about your TV ministry. I watch Charles Stanley every Sunday. He's a good preacher. And I remember one time where he says, well, I have a lot of emails from people wanting to know why I'm not wanting to preach money. Right. And he says, and I can only say this, and I'm going to say it one time. If you're a Christian, you'll know what to do with your money. That's right. That's right. If Charles Stanley Ministry touches you, send the money. He's not asking for money. They do. You know, one thing he did do which kind of bothered me is they, they had a prayer that they were asking people to write in for for the military as they were going off to Desert Storm and they said, you know, uh, there's no obligation, nothing, just email us and we'll send it in. And uh, so I emailed them and I gave them my address and they sent to me. And I mean, for the past 12 years or whatever it is, I've been getting almost monthly from the pastor's heart asking me for money. So that's not him. That's just their machine working. Yeah. You know, they've got you in the database. But I, I was like, they would have saved themselves a lot of money in postage by now after all these things I've gotten. Did you ask but, them to drop you? No. You know what? I didn't ask them to add me. They will drop you. Well, I understand. But I didn't ask them to add me, and I'm not spending the 41 cents or whatever it is to ask them to drop me. It's, it is what it is, and eventually they'll drop me when they don't get any money. But, you know, and maybe they already have because it's been a while. But he is a, a good preacher. He's one of the good preachers. Adrian Rogers used to be before he died, you know. 
Um, yeah, some of these guys are, but the m majority of them on these Christian TV channels are just, they're so loopy in their doctrine. The biggest argument my wife and I ever had was over, what's this guy's name, Jeremiah or something? David Jeremiah. David oh. Jeremiah. I, I, I'm not a fan of David Jeremiah. I'll tell you, I went, we went up here to Tampa to see him when he was there. And he walked out there and she says, oh, he was wonderful. And she said, what do you think? I think I had the weirdest feeling the whole hour that we were in there. Yeah. I didn't like him. And Mom knows why I don't like him. And I don't like him. And there's Mine is doctrinally based. It's not, it's not him as a person. It's not his presentation, which is good. I don't know where he gets his sermons. I don't personally think he writes them himself. But uh, I, my beef with him is doctrinal in nature. And I, I just, I, I don't want anything to do with him. I, but. I, so I said, you do what you have to. So she said, well, I'm just sending money. And I said, well, you'll do it over my objections. But if you want to do it, go ahead and do it. <laughs> well, after about a year, she said, I think you're right. Yeah. So she, Good. Eyes are opened, you know, and that's just the way it is. He's a great speaker. He's very good at presenting. His voice makes him sound very humble and very on target. And like I say, his message is always very good, but he came out with a particular doctrine, which I brought up here just recently, so I'm not going to get into it again. But I, 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 I don't, I just can't listen to him or watch him because of the way he misrepresented that particular issue so badly it was either incompetence or it was a bold-faced lie, one or the other. There's no other two options on it. But we'll, we'll end with that because I don't want to... I'm not going to mention the church or that, but I went to a fundraiser one time for this church, and I felt uncomfortable from the minute I walked in till the minute I walked out. Wow. And Diane says, well, I'm going to support it. And I says... Under my, over my dead body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one I'm going to say, no, no, no. Yep, absolutely. What well, I'll tell you about Charles Stanley is I went to a conference with his son, and I might have mentioned this before, but I'll, I'll mention it again, is that I went to a conference with his son because of grace, uh, what, five months ago or four months ago, whatever it was. It wasn't too long ago. And he said, the one thing I remember about my dad when he wasn't preaching, as he was in the shed laying on his face praying. And I thought, that's the kind of guy that's going to go far in the world. And he has already, don't get me wrong, but he, he knows his priorities. And I'm the worst prayer person in the world, so I got all the respect in the world for Charles Stanley when I heard that. Anybody that is praying like that is sincere. You know, that's, that's all there is to it. He's just very sincere. He's very gifted as well. Yeah, he is. It, the, the conference he was at, I, it was okay. It was good for the purpose it was at, but... Um, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a sermon or anything, and I haven't personally heard him myself. But, uh, yeah, just hearing that about his dad was very uplifting. So, okay, Ken, go ahead. I don't know where you were. Okay. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up. Okay, 14 and 15, they envied him and they stopped up his wells. What does that sound like? To get, well, not only children, but I, I, I'm thinking about a particular context. It happened to Abraham. Well, it happened to Abraham, but I'm talking about, I, I don't want to say it because if I do, what does this sound like, something you can refer to in your own life? With, I don't want, I, I'll have to, how about if I say in the modern times then? Jealousy. Jealousy, but in the modern times. Jealous of, uh, oh, you mean what's going on now? What does this sound like? Democrats. No, well, it does that too, definitely. <laughs> what I'm thinking of, I didn't want to give it away, but here's what I'm thinking. This, nothing has changed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Israel is yeah. back in the land, which was a waste exactly. for 2,000 years. Yeah. They moved yeah. back in, and within 80 years, it is the Garden of Eden on earth. It is the most beautiful place, and all of a sudden, all of this shows right back up. Yeah, yeah, that, right. They, he prospers because he is diligent, because he's worked hard, and above all, because God blessed him. Yes. That's right. And then what happens? All of these other people that can't get out of their own way, go over there. If you think I'm making this up, go over there and look. Here's, what, here's the difference between Israel 
And I'm not talking about the land because they're all in the same land. They've taken like this little city and they said this is a Palestinian city, Nazareth, for example. And we'll say, um, uh, yeah, you're in one little city that's Jewish and you walk in there and the people are doing this. They're working and they're be watering flowers and everything is clean and everything is nice.